Yeah, welcome back. Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jake Fidel. It's a five o'clock block on, on a given Wednesday, and uh, we have George Kaysen here to, to do the movie show. And the movie we're looking at today is a very interesting movie, and it has relevance to our strange and difficult times, and it's called The Wolf's Call, French movie. Um, George, did you like it? Yes, it was very interesting. It keeps you at the edge of your seat throughout the most of the whole movie. And uh, yeah, I liked I, I liked it. I was sad that all those people died at the end, I, you know, but it was a very good and very much for the current situation of what we're dealing with. Well, tell me how, you know, first, first, we should know just the general environment of the movie. So it's a, a couple of French submarines, uh, yep. a bunch of French submariners, um, French foreign policy, French um, military policy, I guess. I think yep. it takes place in Marseille, wherever the you know, the French naval base is uh, uh, in the south of France. Um, and uh, it's about um, a young fellow who has very good hearing. And, uh, and he can spot a, a pattern of sound on a scope yes. uh, more than most human beings sure. can do it. And uh, then you get into the contention between one French submarine and, um, gee, I guess, I guess it's the, the Russians, but it's also... It's it's the Turks, I think, isn't it? Oh, no, uh, they're both they're, they're It's uh, the underground submarine is Al Qaeda. Uh, that that that. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it's oh, not. Yeah. It, it's the and both submarines that are in, into play are both French submarines. Right. One of them is non-nuclear, and one of them is nuclear. One of them is not immediately at the front end, you know, of their no, technology. No, I, I, th I think the, they're both nuclear. The, the non-nuclear was the one that they found at the bottom of the sea that was, they finally figured out it was Al-Qaeda, you know, it was jihadists. Yeah, but the two, the two battling submarines, one was Grandchamp and the other one was uh, um, Alfort, you know, at the end, those were both French. One was an escort for the other. Uh, the um, the 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 Titan or Titan was the export for the Formidable. The Formidable was the one that had the nuclear warhead. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, the yeah. nuclear the, the, warhead. The Titan was not nuclear, or at least it didn't have nuclear warheads. It didn't have a and, nuclear. And, and we had two scenarios in here. One somewhere uh, North Africa, I guess, where they're trying to extract. No. Uh, right, no, extract French soldiers from some Syria. Attack. It was Syria. Syria, yeah. yeah. Uh, extract French soldiers from you know a battlefield. Part of Syria, right? Okay, and uh, and you get to meet the crew. You get to meet the technology, and and then you know the the crew and technology, um, you know, uh, they evolve because there there is an issue somewhere in the North Sea with a Russian submarine, uh, and it, it's uh, it's it's that old um, contention between submarine and submarine in the Cold War. Yeah, in yes, this case, yes, it's the, yes. the Formidab uh, is a nuclear and mm -hmm. nuclear missile submarine, yeah. the most advanced submarine the French have. Yeah. And it's uh, in contention with a, 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 a Russian submarine, which is up there um, and involved in war games, if you will, war, war tactics with the French. Uh, and that's very interesting because you thought up to this point um, that the only kinds of you know contention between submarines was american submarines versus russian uh, the cold war submarine game uh, but no in this case there are no american vessels involved uh, it is only french and it is their technology their crews their systems um, you know the whole thing is french and you you get to see it um, through the eyes of the french that's a new experience Okay, yes. but now you said, and this is really important, you said that this is very relevant to our times. Definitely. And I, you said that before the show began, and I would like to hear your thoughts on it. A, a lot of these, the, the scenario here is very much for the current times. Uh, the missile, we'll, we'll get into the specifics, the missile that was coming from what we from Russia from Russia, or we thought they thought was coming from Russia, right? Uh, uh, was that because Russia was going to invade Finland, right? Uh, that threatening to invade Finland, then the, the the operation in Syria on off the Tartus coast 
where the French submarine, the Titan, Titan, Titan uh, that was because French military, undercover military, were in Syria killing jihadists or whatever in, in, in Syria, or, or maybe getting against uh, uh, Assad's people. I don't know. But they were in Syria. And that they were rendezvous, the, the, the submarine Titan was there to pick up after the, the operation, these uh, French military guys that were on undercover to get them it back on the ship and take them back to France. To, so extract, was, to extract them. Yeah, to extract them from France. Now this guy, I think it was named Chartain, the guy who really hears really good, really fantastic hearing and sonar. The wolf's call means you hear a sonar and then you drop a, a bomb on them. That's the wolf's call. That's what in, in Navy slang, that's what wolf's call means, right? Well, so, no, no. Wolf's call is the sound signature of a particular class of submarine. Um, and he had the ability to recognize that sound signature. Um, and it isn't always possible. You, you need somebody with very good ears to distinguish the sound signature of one vessel, one submarine as against another. So the wolf's call was specific to a certain class of of Russian submarine, no? Oh, well, the thing is, I, I sort of looked it up and, and that's what it said was Navy slang. But the, when you talk about the Russian submarine, that's an interesting thing too, because the guy with the fantastic hearing, and initially he thought that it was a, a dead whale or a sick whale on the bottom of the ocean. But then his hearing's telling him that there's propeller, you know, it's like an old submarine with propellers, it's four propellers. So it's not a nuclear submarine. It says, oh, this, this is, there's something on the bottom. And then through do, do, doing studies, because and it, later in the show, what they do is because he was smoking some pakalolo with his girlfriend, right? He's, it showed up in, in his blood, uh, in, his, in his urine, when they, when they went to put him on back on the Formidable, which was the nuclear submarine, right? So um, they pulled him off because the, the admiral said, no way you're going to be on there. So he finds out, he goes, he goes into his uh, supervisor's computer, he hacks into it, and then he goes into archives and finds out that that's an old Russian submarine. Now, knowing Soviet Union like I do, right? Black market, one of the crooked Soviet admirals had went and sold this to, uh, to the jihadists, right? That uh, when, yeah, in, in Syria. So, the, so the, the, the submarine located the French submarine because they were on the bottom, they were, you know, doing their, their sonar going up. And then they got in touch with Iranian, um, some Iranians. Who, who, who have put a helicopter to try to, you know, bomb from, top, from the top of the ocean. Yeah, depth uh, charges, depth charges. Depth charges to, to kill these, this French submarine, right? So, so th th it's so much intrigue here, right? And then eventually they find out that, I forgot the name of it, Tartus or something, the name of the old Soviet submarine, right? That's now in the hands of, of the jihadists, right? Working in, in connection with uh, the Iranians, you know, who, who this whole thing gets really interesting, right? Now, it, I don't want to get too far ahead, but the thing is, you have a missile coming from what seems to be Russia heading to uh, France, nuclear. It seems to be a nuclear missile that's going to um, bomb France, right? Because this is what the French military thought. So they set up the Formidable with the nuclear warhead to, bought, to, to send it to Russia. This is what happens when you have Cold War, like we have again now. And I, as I said before the show, Putin is not going to back down. He's gung ho. He thinks this is Russians glo Russia's glory and his security. So we're talking about a very similar situation as what could conceivably happen now. You have a nuke. A, ostensibly a nuclear mission, missile, missile with a warhead coming from Russia to France. So the French send, send a nuclear warhead with um, Grand Champ, which is on the Formidable, he's the, the head guy on the Formidable, to send it to Russia, right? But then 
the, the guy with the good hearing says, you know, he's listening to the missile. He says, doesn't sound right. Doesn't have a nuclear missile. It's, it's, it's just a missile without a nuclear warhead. So the Al Qaeda is trying to create war between Russia and, the West, and, and Europe, right? The West, right? Just like they did 9-11 bastards, you know? So bottom line is, this is the whole plot of, the, of this movie. So then what you gotta do is Chartain, right? He, he, he breaks into, he gets himself onto, on, on the, tit on the tit Titan, which is the ship that's like a, a like escort. escort ship, right? And senior moment, I forget. Yeah, so uh, to, to try to get this um, Grand Champ, who used to be his, his, his supervising, you know, the head of the ship, He's now on the formidable because he got he got you know an advancement. He got it promoted, right? And they're trying to convince um, Grand Champ to stop the missile. But wait, wait, Glenn, you're you're going so fast. You know, okay. this is um, probably an example of a movie you have to watch more than once. Yeah. You, you caught a lot of detail that I didn't catch. Yeah, I um, suffice to say, it's very tense. It's very high tech. Yes. You know, and that's one of the surprising things about the movie that the French are so advanced yeah. and that, you know, they had to have permission. The, the filmmaker had to have permission to get on not one, but two nuclear, I mean, yeah, two, two French subs and show us the control room, show us the sonar, the radar, yes. all the displays, yes. um, show us how they moved around, uh, how they dealt with it and show us their, I mean, I don't know if it was accurate or not, but they uh, showed us their their nuclear systems. Okay, but let me let me interrupt to say sure, that what was sure. happening, what was I happening. I like that there, when you do that, Jay. That's good. You put me in line there. What was what was happening was the, that that uh, it was a provocation that there really was no missile heading for yes. France. They the, whoever set that off, I guess it was you know the ISIS or somebody um, tried to provoke a war, and um, and by that time, however. The Formidab had already started going through its countdown, yes. and they had turned the keys on a missile into into you into uh, Russia. So now there was going to be an attack on Russia, and it was it was um, on the final count, and they couldn't stop it. That's part of the Cold War. That once the sequence, we've seen this. Once the sequence begins, yeah. you you worry about the other guy stopping the sequence, so you make the sequence bulletproof. You can't, nobody can stop it. So the captain of the Bonchamp was, no, the, the Formidab, yeah. um, Bonchamp was his name, Beauchamp, I think. Um, he, he was unable to stop it and he, he really couldn't stop it. So the, the smaller vessel, um, the Titan, um, was charged with somehow getting to him. Yeah. Where I think he was in the North Sea at the time, getting to him and stopping him. And if that meant blowing up to avoid a nuclear war blowing up this 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 the pride of the French Navy yes. um, that is the Formidab, yeah. then blow it up. Um, but the Formidab wasn't taking any wooden nickels. They were dedicated to um, you know achieving their mission and and letting this missile fly into Russia, and, and it gets very tense and it has all the elements of um, the you know the submarine the submarine Cold War kind of exchange. And it was very credible. The only thing that was a surprise, as I said, is the, the level of technology in the French submarines, the level of camaraderie in the French submarines. They weren't fooling around. And, um, you know, the level of sophistication of the exchanges between the French Admiralty um, and, and, and the, you know, between the French elements of the military um, you know, who are charged with protecting France and, and, um, and, and, and sending a missile to uh, Russia. Now, I don't know if it's true. I tell you, I was going to ask you that question. I don't know if it's based on any true stories, but it certainly had the ring of truth of a submarine, nuclear submarine engagement that, we, that just never got to the press. Uh, just, there's so many things about it that ring, that ring true. You wonder. The, the only thing that is troublesome is that, hey, isn't this an American story, not a French story? Yes. Isn't, isn't this American Department of Defense, not the French Department of Defense? Precisely. Uh, but but um, putting that aside, 
Uh, I think you're right. And it's a very timely movie, even though it was made, I believe, just before COVID. Um, they, they predicted, if you will, uh, the, the problems with the Russian attitude and Putin's attitude. Uh, he was, you know, in the movie, uh, Russia was determined and the West saw him as a determined adversary. And it was Cold War for sure. At the time, in the, in the context of this movie, it was Cold War. And so right now, as you said, it's very timely because this could happen. I mean, Putin uh, said in the first week of his invasion, he said he was a nuclear power. He reminded us, well, how would that play out? <laughs> it would play out something like in this movie uh, where people begin to rattle their nuclear sabers and maybe, and here's the thing, maybe they make a mistake that somebody intervenes, intercedes and does a provocation like in the movie. And before you know it, a mistake turns into a, a, a global you know, disaster. Exactly. Um, that's what we are talking about in this movie. And it, in my money, it's better than any of the submarine movies I remember you know, being, being done uh, about the American Cold War. This was the French Cold War. Uh, and it is a, a, a very chilling reminder of where we are today. Yeah, the whole scenario of Finland, you know, be, being uh, Putin has now said that if Finland and Sweden um, be, become part of NATO, that's a, a direct threat to him, direct th threat to Russia. So this is not this Ukraine is, is it, it, it's not stopping at Ukraine, you know. Um, you know, I mean, I have my own ideas, you know, you know, you know, you know what Putin is, right? Why provoke him? Because he's not going to back all the sanctions is not going to stop him. So we're, we're headed to something like this. You know, Finland, same as in the movie, you know, Syria, you know, with the Russia is, is, is involved in Syria with Turkey, right? Um, Iran. All, what? Iran. What Iran is involved here. All the players that are currently in today's world, uh, the, this, the problem, the problem, childs are all involved here, you know. So, so you you got the it, it's a very apropos movie for what we're dealing with today and what we may be dealing with tomorrow. So, I mean, I would like to see hopefully try to lower the 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 the, the tensions with Russia because. I'm afraid, you know, nuclear war, you know, if, I mean, I don't know how you're going to do this. Biden go and talk to Putin and try to, the Australian uh, president went and tried to talk some sense into Putin, you know, but he's adamant, you know, he's adamant that Ukraine, this thing in Ukraine is a threat to Russia economically and militarily. So he's going to, he's not going to back down. So how do we, how do we get out of this? You know, you, you get back to, and I, I don't know, you're probably not going to agree with me. Jen Stoltenberg is pushing to expand NATO. He wants to expand NATO. And, and Putin is totally opposed to that, right? So it, how do you get beyond this kind of, you know, the two of them butting heads? It's worrisome. This, this, this movie is right on target because if, 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 if the guy with the good hearing, right, Chartain, right, if he hadn't been able to get into... Gonchamp's uh, head at the last moment as Gonchamp was dying on that formidable to pull out, to stop the, the missile, we would have had, there would have been nuclear war from France and Russia, it would have been, the United States would have been involved, it would have been World War III, maybe destroy the whole world, you know? So this is a very, very good movie for now. And to sort it's of- not, it's not a, there's, there's no redeeming you know, Hollywood in there. The only guy who survives between the two submarines is uh, is the guy with the hearing. Right. Uh, that, right? And, and he loses his hearing. He loses it's his very hearing. Very ironic. How do these these writers think these things up? <laughs> I mean, the key point was this guy. This guy's hearing was the, the whole plot was based on the guy's hearing. And at the last moment in the movie, he becomes deaf, you know. I can't even talk to his beautiful girlfriend anymore. You know, he won't even hear it. So, I mean, these writers, it's its brilliant. I mean, to think that this was the whole thing and then he, you know, they saw the blood coming out of his ears. So it's, it's a, it, it, as I said at the, at the beginning, this had me at the edge of my seat 
yeah, throughout me too. the whole movie. My it wife was, said, how come you didn't fall asleep? I said, how can I, how can I fall asleep with a movie like this? Let's talk about the, the, the juncture, the intersection between the entertainment, because I, I, I guess this is not a real story. This is not based on a real story. Mm-hmm. It's written as if it were, but it is not. Um, and so what you have is movies like this, which um, you know pretend to track on the elements of the reality in Ukraine and in Europe, yeah. um, but but are only toying with us, uh, giving us entertainment. And we watch, we're glued to the tube because we think that somehow this is going to teach us something about those elements, about what's going on in Europe. But it, you know, frankly, it's, it's sometimes it's hard in our in our world of consciousness, or sometimes not so conscious. Um, to define, to distinguish between the entertainment, which is pretty serious stuff, and the reality. Flip the channel. Just flip the channel over and you get Ukraine. And you get you know, Russia talking about nuclear weapons and chemical weapons and biological weapons and all that. And, and so you, you know, it's just a matter of a digital turn from one channel to another. And it's almost like they blend together. It's almost like, you know, you've got to sort of separate them in your mind. You've got to be careful not to let one influence the other. This, the, this French movie, The Wolf's Call, it could make you think, maybe subconsciously make you think that we are there already, that we are in a cold water with nuclear weapons, that the, the nations and the, and the military uh, and the navies of Europe are capable of being provoked, capable of being fooled and are ready to launch nuclear weapons or not. And this is what they think about and do. And, and this is probably true for the US, except we don't think about it so much because I think we can make the distinction easier somehow between the art and the reality. But this movie somehow you know, allows the two to touch each other. Yes. And yeah. then you say, are we in a, a nuclear confrontation now? Um, are we in a Cold War, which is a nuclear war? Um, is Russia that crazy? Um, are the French, you know, that determined? Uh, is the technology that good or bad, as the case may be? It's not clear, and I and I think this is kind of a recipe. And, and I've often referred to um, the Guns of August, a, a great historical report of the origins of World War I by Barbara Tuckman, yeah. a great historian, um, where you, know, you see elements, or, or the Winds of War series on television back in the 80s uh, with Robert Mitchum and Ali McGraw, if you remember that. The point is you, you see these elements in the, in the art or in the reality, in the case of Barbara Tuckman, and you try to track on them and you say, my goodness gracious, we are, on a pathway to war. And it's what you were saying before. When you take all this together and you look at these elements and you compare it against what might be, and even the, you know, when I call it the fictional value of some of these movies, you say, well, wait a minute, we really are on a pathway to war. And it's, it's all a matter of tripping the wrong switches yes. and having a switch automatically trip another switch and before you know it, all the switches are tripped and, and the, the worst imaginable result can happen. And madmen, uh, as well as automated machines, are determining the future of humanity. Yes. And you could easily say that right now, George. Precisely what you're saying. That is so true. You know, I, just to get on a side, I remember Rod Serling there was a, one of his shows, you know, the Twilight Zone, how there was a, 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 something circling the earth, you know, and then another missile, another uh, one of those, they, the two came together and, and, and the mission was to, one was to uh, kill um, radiation or some kind of poisons. And the other one said, you know, for man, and the two came together and the, the mission became kill kill human beings, you know, eradicate human beings. So bottom line is machines, they don't have any mind of their own. They can make mistakes. And if you have somebody crazy, you know, who, who's paranoid, right? A human being, 
then you, like Putin is feeling right now, you know, that you, this could lead to what you're saying, you know. So it's it's art, it's fiction, but it was done in 2019. It's much more apropos now in 2022 with where we're going with Ukraine. I mean, this is this is I'm worried. I'm this is ominous. I mean, you know, this is an ominous situation. I mean, I don't know where this is going to go. I would hope that the UN or someone can try to sit these people down. That you know, Stoltenberg and Putin sit them in front of a table and say, you know, let's try to find some common ground here. You know, and, no, and there's no well, George. There's no common ground. He's crazy. Um, he's a doctor, no, and he's got his hand on the nuclear button, and he's trying to use that to rule the world, and he is effectively ruling the world. He's got them terrified in Europe. Although, you know, what strikes me, and this is another movie that you and I have talked about, is the Don't Look Up movie. While these uh, threatening existential threats are all over us, while we're facing the, the possibility of a, you know, a, a, a total disaster, yeah. a global disaster, you, you turn the channel one more notch and you get a soccer game where nobody in the stadium knows about what's going on in Ukraine. And you turn the channel one more time and, and you get, you know, some kind of um, party thing or something that, that is absolutely oblivious to the reality. And so, and people watch that. So I, I, I guess what I'm saying is, um, the media, the television does not give us an accurate reflection of what is really going on. Even the news does not give us an accurate reflection. So it's somehow it's uh, it's it's um, it's blurred by the entertainment aspect. It's blurred by the way the media reports it. It's blurred by the soccer game where people don't care. Um, and you know, this is it just it feels so much like um, don't look up to me where, where people are oblivious to the reality. So true. Oh. You know, I'm on social media and I get into little insignificant kind of stuff, you know, who, who's kissing their dog and people are, that's that's what people react to and what's going on in the world and serious stuff, as you said. A lot of people are not tuned into this at all. They're just oblivious to it. A lot of people in Europe are not tuned in. We've had a number of talk shows with people who are tuned in. And I asked them, I said, you know, are your friends and compatriots, uh, are they tuned in? They say, no. Oh. You know, they'd rather go to a soccer game. Um, and, and so, I, you know, I, I'm a little worried about that. The leadership, though, the ones who create the French Navy and, the cre you know, the, the French nuclear Navy, uh, they they make those decisions, their decisions. So um, the, 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 the future of the world will be determined by only a few people, not by, not by a lot, not by most of us. Yeah. We just, we're here for the ride and we can't do much about it. And that's the, that's the really frightening thing about Putin. He's, uh, he's one person doing his strategy and on the other side, the fence, uh, these democratic relatively speaking, democratic countries that are that, that have trouble getting consensus. And uh, his his uh, genocide um, tends to bring them together. But at the same time, um, they they have issues, other political issues, which tend to fragment them. So they may not be as focused as he is. And he knows that. So his threats of nuclear war, of, of um, biological war, of chemical war, are terrifying. Yes. Because they won't know how to respond. You know, even Biden, he says, well, we have evidence, we have intelligence to suggest that there's, you know, going to be, there is already um, chemical weapons being deployed in eastern Ukraine. Uh, okay, what are you going to do about it? You're going to do your own? Um, what are you going to do? Is that going to heighten your willingness to engage, to put troops on the ground or, or planes in the air? No, we'll just report it to you. We'll, we'll give you the, the bad news. And so I, I, don't, I don't know how this is going to work out, but I don't see it working out very well. And indeed, in the movie, it didn't work out very well. Well, it, it, nuclear 
Holocaust was avoided. Okay? Yes, definitely. But at, at the price of many lives. Yes. Uh, and that, that's the most interesting part. It, it does show you that the national interest in that particular movie was far greater than the interest of any of the characters. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But, but I mean, it, I, I, that turned out pretty good, but, but um, I don't, you know, the situation now, I mean, he's got the button, the red button for nuclear war, and we do too, you know? So what happens if we start with nuclear war? He's, he's not gonna back down, you know? He's, I mean, just listen to what he's saying. He had that rally. I mean, from his perspective, as distorted as it is, this is Russia's glory and Russian's economic and military security that he's fighting for in Ukraine. And he's killed, he killed all those 10,000 people in Maripol or wherever. It's brutal. I mean, Maripol. So, yeah, so question, what, 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 how, how good a movie is this? Uh, we've, we've given context, and I'm happy we're able to do that. Um, and I appreciate your thoughts on it. Yeah. But as a movie, as a review of a movie, what do you give it? All those things considered. I give, I give it a nine because, because a little bit of, like you said, it's not, you know, it's, it's pulling us into uh, a scenario that we're really not, we're really not there yet, but we may be soon. So I'll, I'll give it a nine. So are you are you are you diminishing the the rating for it because of that? I mean, what about uh, you know? For example, I thought the movie was well made. Yeah. Um, the, the production values were very high. The tension, as you said, was very high. Yeah. Um, the exposure to new things, new ideas, new technologies—things we didn't ever think about before. Yes. yes. Uh, in terms of the French, seeing it through the French lens. Uh, as seeing it as uh, the wolf's call and understanding about what goes on in the control room. You know, I, I covered the, uh, the uh, Ehemi Maru issue for PBS. I was, I was the PBS reporter on the news hour. Right. Um, I, and I covered the, um, the court of inquiry proceedings that investigated that. And um, I tell you, I learned a lot about control rooms in nuclear submarines. In fact, we had a tour of the, that's really quite something. I consider that a high point in my own, you know, journalistic life uh, to go on a nuclear submarine. It was a sister submarine, it's a Cheyenne in uh, Pearl Harbor and, and, and stand there in the control room and understand what every device was about and, uh, and look into the compartment where, you know, they had the nuclear reactors. I mean, that, that was an incredible experience. Um, and this movie, very few people have had that experience, you know. Uh, this movie gives you that kind of introduction to the, the devices and the technology and the procedures that you see on a French nuclear submarine. And I'll tell you, I learned, and I thought I knew, at least from my experience with the, uh, the Greenville incident, um, but this went further. So I was happy to see that. So on the technical level, on the interest level, on, on, the, on the whole French lens of it, I would give it a 10, that's me. Um, but I agree with you that in, in the world of movies and the connection of movies and reality, maybe, maybe it should be reduced a little because, because it's so scary. Yeah, you know, the whole thing about the guy with the hearing, you know, and then he loses his hearing, that's sort of, left me a little, you know. Sort of no, but it's true. That's, that's not fictitious. I, I know that's what happens when you when you have to go pop, to, you know, through the different from, you know, you lose your hearing because of the different. No, no, I don't mean that part. I mean, the, the idea you put a, a headset on one of those fellas and yes, they have a certain technology that can look at it. Oh, yeah. I yeah. mean, they can look at the waveforms. Yes. Um, but it takes hearing to distinguish the you know, waveforms that are similar. It's not, it's not only you know, the waveform identification, maybe through AI, yeah. it distinguishes one kind of you know, propeller, propeller system from another. Uh, it's the individual. And I think that's a true fact. 
I think if you went in a nuclear submarine right now, there'd be somebody just like him. I think that was a reality. That's, yeah, my, I, guess. That's my guess. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not questioning that. I'm just questioning the whole scenario where the guy who's got the amazing hearing gets his ear, his ears pop. You know, that, that whole thing of losing his. Well, more than that, though, George, I mean, he was down at, uh, at you know, at some depth. Probably you know five six seven hundred yeah, who yeah, knows that, how many feet. That's real, yeah. And uh, yeah, and and he he was the only one that got out. Yeah. And he didn't have equipment. He was not prepared um, to surface uh, slowly, which you would have to do very slowly in order to avoid the bends. Right. So it wasn't only that he popped his ears. Uh, I think you know. Um, I think it's a real risk of of death. Yeah. By, by by way of the bends. Right. And that was, I don't think that was completely accurate. If he if he came out of a torpedo tube or whatever at that depth and went to the surface, it would be more serious than just his ears. Right. Anyway, that's Dr. Fidel speaking to you, George. Yeah, uh, you're, you're, you're more familiar with the military kind of stuff. I haven't been in that situation, I'll tell you. But it, let's, it, let, let's talk about the next one. The next one's coming up. Um, yeah. The next one, the next one is going to be the promise. Yes. Uh, yeah. What do you know about the promise? I saw it a few years ago. Right. There's some pluses and minuses. Um, you know, uh, they took a real situation and they turned it into, you know, it's sort of like a fairy tale thing of um, a romance and stuff like that. Some of the realities of Musada were not exactly, you know, right. So. Um, um, a lot of the reviewers were saying that that this was too there was too much frivolity in this, but the key point, Jay, is what I mentioned, and you said it was because the Turks don't want to be have a bad mark on their on, on them, right? The Turkish government is that um, a lot of the there was an, a, a a movement of of mostly Turkish men who got on and uh, and downgraded in on the rotten to, on tomatoes rotten, what is it rotten tomatoes and other um, fandango and things like that th without even seeing the movie i mean they, they i mean here i oh, am no, it, was, it was political yeah <clears throat> the movie made it clear that there was there was a genocide yeah, yeah. that 1.5 million armenians were murdered yeah. Uh, in 1914 or so, um, and uh, intentionally, willfully, and for no good reason at all, yeah. um, and that the Turkish government has never owned up to it, uh, even till now, it's, it's 100 years ago. Yeah. So we, we should cover the movie next time. Yes, we will. Um, it, has, it has a certain uh, reality to it. It is it intended to be there, you know, the, uh, a document, not a documentary, but a docudrama, I would say they take certain liberties, but the, but the general principle of, of the uh, Armenian genocide is there. And uh, I think they cover a lot of things that it's worth seeing. Yeah, there, so, there, there was revolutionary activity to, a, to an extent, right? But they basically cleaned out everybody. And, and I'll get into my, this time I'm going to get into my family who were very much Ottoman in the economy, industrialists, and they also got killed. And they were totally loyal to the Sultan. Um, and his okay, well, good. That'll be a valuable discussion. That's going to be what we're going to talk about. But thank it, you, George. George Jason, the movie show covering these very interesting movies and connecting them up. Thank you so much, George. Thank you, Jay. Take care. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.